The Speaker, I can tell you that both initiatives will deliver more than what that last government attempted to when, for instance, they put out a $1 billion infrastructure scheme. Tēnā koutou, I'm Selwyn Manning and welcome to this episode, which is number 21 for this year, of A View From Afar. And today, political scientist Paul Buchanan and I are going to analyse this notion, and perhaps it's a reality, of Trumpism beyond Trump. In earlier episodes, Paul and I have examined how Trumpism and even Bannonism has been exported as a cult around the world, a cultural kind of political movement that is washed up in shores that you would never have guessed. And we've given detail, for example, of, of examples of this and how it manifests in countries as untypical as New Zealand and Brazil, for example. And today, Paul and I will deep dive into this notion um, that while Brazil's outgoing President Bolsonaro was narrowly defeated by his leftist or left-positioned rival Lula, there's a risk that Brazil's version of Trumpism will live on well after electoral defeats at the ballot box and enforce what Paul says is a formidable impediment, potentially, to the successor's policies. So that's going to be an interesting discussion. We really encourage you to participate in that. And in addition, also, we will examine what to expect from the United States midterm elections. And for, for example, will the GOP, the grand old party, the Republican Party, and the Trump-endorsed candidates assist it in removing a Democratic majority in the US Senate? Now, remember, the Senate is probably the most interesting thing here that it is closely fought the United United States House of Representatives, no doubt we'll touch on that too and Paul will expand on what we could probably expect and the results in that uh, forum as well. And finally, and importantly, we will explore the Israel elections and whether Benjamin Netanyahu will return as the dominant figure in Israel's political sphere and really what that means and having a bit of a look at the demographics of Israel and also uh, what Israel is inching toward uh, becoming from a political science point of view. So Paul's got some interesting takes on that and really strong angles that I don't think have been expressed in other places. Um, but before we cross to Paul, here's our invitation to you who are joining us live. Um, do feel free to interact with us while we are live on YouTube and or Facebook, but YouTube is probably best as Facebook has been undergoing changes and we've put links to the, face, uh, the YouTube um, uh, platform um, where you may be um, accessing this from. But remember, if you do make comments or lodge questions, your interactions may be included in this broadcast. So let's um, kick the show on the road, cross to Paul, and we'll lead on with discussing the elections that had occurred in Brazil. Um, good afternoon, Ehó. Ka pai to see you once again. Oh, Tanakwe, Selwyn. It's uh, good to see you yet again. Yeah. Um, so, Paul, uh, we've got a lot, a lot on the uh, the plate today, and I'm just going to hand it over to you um, to to take us through. In the first instance, the Brazilian elections. We discussed it last week, and it was a fascinating prelude to what we could expect. And I went onto those maps, Paul. And I know you're a fan of maps. And I went onto those maps, and I could see Bolsonaro's strength in the south, just like you said, coming through on election night. 
and mm. in the, in the mm. account that uh, followed that over the next day. Um, and I was thinking, man, on that map, it looks like a country totally divided um, on a southern and northern hemisphere largely. But anyway, Paul, you are the expert in these things, in particular with South American politics. It's an absolute pleasure to discuss these kind of things with you. Um, so over to you. What do you make of the result? And what, what about our main theme that you'd uh, like to talk about, meaning uh, Trumpism beyond Trump? Yeah, the parallels between the U.S. and Brazil are really quite striking, and we'll get to the U.S. in due course. Uh, just as a prelude, we should remember that the Brazilian Constitution and its political makeup was modeled on the United States. Uh, very small congressional districts, uh, a lot of gerrymandering, as it turns out. I mean, the parallels, unfortunate in my mind, are, are very real, which is why um, Steve Bannon, uh, Jason Miller, and other American strategists came down to help Bolsonaro with his campaign. Uh, and again, did full Trump rhetoric and that sort of stuff. Remember, Bolsonaro fashioned himself, as I said last week, as the Trump of the South or the Trump of the tropics. Well, fortunately, in my mind, again, uh, he lost, but he lost by 1.2%. Uh, 50.8 for Lula, uh, 49.3, 40, 49.4 for Bolsonaro, which is a relatively small you know, margin of victory for Lula. And as you pointed out, Bolsonaro carried the industrial belt of Brazil, uh, something we discussed last week, but he, he carried that. Now, the bigger question, and I'll throw it out there and return to it, is that sometimes the movement doesn't need the man. That is to say that maybe, and I think this is the calculus in Brazil, is that Bolsonaro, Bolsonaroism or Bolsonarista um, the movement will uh, outlive him or at least his term in office. I'll give you a parallel to understand the concept. When uh, Augusto Pinochet in Chile in 1989 ran a referendum on whether he should stay as president in a civilian capacity, right, retire from uniform, go in under a constitution that he and his people had handwritten, the referendum was mostly about him, but about the future of Chilean politics. And it turns out uh, he lost that referendum. And I should point out, I was at uh, the University of Notre Dame's Kellogg Institute of International Studies when that referendum was held. And I happened to be there with a Chilean sociologist who was instrumental in uh, organizing the opposition to Pinochet in that referendum. And the point he was making is that Pinochet had the language of the referendum was something like, do you support the general and his glorious project of restoring the greatness of Chile or not? So the yes vote was for Pinochet and the no vote was against that project. And uh, now I remember his name, Eugenio Tironi. He said to me, do you realize how hard it is to turn a no vote into an affirmation of democracy, uh, you know, a, a response to dictatorship? Because it's incredibly hard. And so they lobbied and they organized and whatnot. Anyway, Pinochet had lost. And, you know, everybody was amazed. Well, here's the thing. It turns out that the American government in the first instance, and so we'll give them credit. This was, you know, this was the, uh, the late stages of the Reagan regime. They let it be known to the Chilean military and more importantly, the business elites that perhaps it was time for the old man to retire because they would have control of the constitution. They would have control over Congress uh, nothing was going to change, and he was a lightning rod for criticism. So maybe the conservative movement of Chile could move on past the persona of Augusto Pinochet. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, start uh, to see your parallels now. here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and by the way, that, that authoritarian constitution of Chile is still exists today because the new socialist president wasn't be able to carry it over the line. It was rejected in a referendum just two months ago. 
So we're, mm -hmm. Chile still operates under Pinochet's constitution. Well, my understanding is this. In Brazil, several of Bolsonaro's biggest allies won their respective elections for governorships, including the governorships in the industrial belt and in the Senate. Uh, they will be powerful figures in the national legislature, as well as these, you know, hyper important uh, gov governorships. And it has become clear with uh, Joe Biden's rapid recognition of Lula, I mean, within 24 hours, well, within 12 hours, uh, Biden and other world leaders all recognize Lula, that the signal is this. The signal to the Brazilian military and its economic elites is that they can continue unimpeded even if Bolsonaro goes. That the movement is what matters, not the man. And in fact, if you step back, as, let's say as a big business guy in Sao Paulo or as a general in the army, Bolsonaro can be an impediment to pursuing conservative agendas because he's a nutter. I mean, it, you know, I, I won't mince words. This guy is, you know, strange. So, th and so, so this whole thing is illustrating a difference between populism and Trumpism, isn't it? You know, that, that well, Bolsonaro well, may have been a morph of both, but when they no longer kind of are able to hold up the populism through whatever me mechanism, that the movement's bigger than that. That it, populism is just an yeah. appendage to it. Yeah. That, that populism may, in fact, be an impediment. I mean, again, it's it's the overall project that matters. It's not the monkey who may be driving it at any given point. And Bolsonaro's behavior is is downright monkey-ish. I mean, it's you know he's he's a parody of a populist, and that's injurious the capitalist interests over the long term. I mean, I don't want to hammer on capitalists, but let's be very honest. Right-wing politicians of the silk are tools of economic interests and security interests. You know, they're pawns in a bigger game. Bolsonaro was clearly not aware of that. Uh, he was into himself. He courted the evangelicals. You know, he did a lot of things, but he didn't understand the fundamental, which is once you start behaving in a way that alarms and then alienates fractions of the business classes, uh, as well as your international allies, um, you know, you can no longer serve the purpose uh, of being their tool. I think Bolsonaro has reached that point, but there is a caveat. His movement will continue. And he, in four years or so, has the opportunity to come back and run again. And so it's not as if he's gone forever. And his actions in the last few days have been very, very telling. He finally, after 48 hours of, you know, hiding and, you know, in his closet or whatever he did after the election, he comes out and he doesn't concede. Uh, he talks about all the people who supported him, which again, are a lot of people. And uh, he says he'll respect the constitution uh and the the process of transition and he leaves how, and how, how, chief... how is that um that, that's different to trump yeah you know and, and well, stands we'll out quite a, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The parallels See, there because we were we were worried that bolsonaro was going to um spark into gear the military apparatus to actually resist the democratic vote if it went against him um, we, we thought that um, there were going to be, you know, police acting in his interest as opposed to the Constitution's interests or the people's interests. Um, but we saw the police attached to pushing off the Bolsonaro protest, pro-protesters, -pro those that represented the movement that were trying to take uh, different places. Oppositions down in the south, it seemed, even the police. That, that's what we saw coming out of the news. What, how did you read those tea leaves, Paul? Ah, oh, wow, look at this is this is a slow moving process. He's testing the waters. Again, Bolsonaro is resisting uh, being removed. I mean, electorally, but obviously the word got to the military. 
that it would be injurious to Brazil's longer term interests to back him, much less try to foment a coup. Again, a lot was learned in Brazil from January 6th in the United States. Um, you know, they see that. But Bolsonaro left out there. He didn't concede. He didn't recognize the legitimacy of Lula's victory. All right. He said he would just follow the Constitution, blah, blah, blah. He was waiting for the military to make a move. He was waiting, you know, so and he still is waiting, quite frankly. But obviously the word has come out that from conservative sectors, again, those business elites, as well as things like the U.S. government. I mean, I would imagine the U.S. ambassador, the uh, defense attache of the U.S. embassy in Brasilia went to the Brazilian high command and said, OK, here's the deal. He's got to go. He lost fair and square. Uh, you guys don't make a move because that's going to now cause problems with us. Uh, you know, just, you know, his movement is staying. And so chill, chill. And what's happened is the word went down to the police that regardless of their opinions about Bolsonaro, they were to repress the people who came out onto the streets and tried to usurp the election, which they are continuing to do. This is not over. I mean, here's the thing, another parallel with Chile, as it turns out. There's now a trucker's strike, basically. The truckers are blocking everything, making trouble. Do you realize that truckers are, by and large, independent operators? They're not unionized. And so they don't have a strike fund. They don't, you know, they can't last long without outside assistance. And in the case of Chile, with the trucker strike of 1973, it was the CIA who provided funds to keep the stru trucker strike going. And it went on for six months and it brought Salvador Allende down. I don't know if they can do that here. I doubt very much that the CIA is going to start funding a Bolsonaro uh, uh, favored trucker strike. So especially when they've got uh, problems back see. home that, that they need to deal with. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, maybe there's money coming in from rich Brazilians. Uh, to help them out. But the word is out to the security apparatus that this sort of nonsense has to stop. Bolsonaro, meanwhile, is just waiting and watching, very much the way Donald Trump sat in his dining room and watched events unfold on January 6th. Bolsonaro's waiting for something to happen. He thinks, and I think he's deluded, that his people will, will heed his call and come out into the streets. And that will force the security apparatus into a dilemma. Do we repress our own people who legitimately believe that the election was stolen? Or do we start cracking heads on them because the election was not stolen? Uh, you notice that Lula has been very quiet. You know, the, the attention is on what is Bolsonaro going to do? Lula's not putting his finger in that mix. He's just waiting the way Bolsonaro is, they're just hoping for two different outcomes. So in this sense, Bolsonaro has learned, uh, maybe because of his American advisors, that he should tacitly admit defeat, but not recognize the legitimacy of his opponent's victory, and then see what happens in a very divided country. Again, 1.2% the margin, uh, uh, or thereabouts, He's, uh, you know, he's he, he's going to wait. The bigger point is that you can have Bolsonaroism without Bolsonaro at the helm. And this that is where you're get it, getting into continue. what that movement does to infect the progress, uh, in, in inverted commas, that Lula may bring to the presidencies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, very good point, because uh, the opposition in Congress will be dominated by Bolsonaro allies. Yeah. So even if Lula has been stalled, his policy agenda is going to be uh, stymied uh, from the get-go. Uh, there will be impediments put in. Again, this is a very disloyal opposition. We've talked about that concept before. These guys don't play nice. They're not really interested in democratic compromise. They're interested in getting back into power. Uh, and they will not stop at literally nothing short of a coup in order to do so. So what's the best way to do that? You prevent Lula from engaging in the sort of policy reforms, uh, let's say on the deforestation of the Amazon, 
and that sort of thing until the next electoral cycle, and then he gets booted yet again. Uh, we have to be very clear here. They, you know, they're going to play uh, a very unpleasant game of obstructionism in order to weaken uh, Lula as a political entity. One thing I think, well, it, it's been covered, so this is not news, but Lula during his first two terms in office lifted 40 million Brazilians out of poverty with his, it's called the Bolsa Familiar, the family basket, which was a, both a fruit, food subsistence and an income support project for disadvantaged people. And let's say the poverty line in Brazil by international standards is pretty low. Uh, you know, so they didn't have to get a lot to move out of that, but he lifted 40 million people. The illiteracy rates in Brazil before Lula came in were on the order of 60%. More people could not read beyond elementary level than could. And he got that to come down to around 45% or thereabouts. The point is Lula did good things, uh, very good things for the Brazilian public. I have a feeling that at least the big business interests and the military understand that. You know, they understand, look, at if he does some, some reforms and not radical, not communist, you know, just tinkers with the taxation system in order to do this, this will actually stabilize Brazilian socioeconomic, uh, socioeconomic system as well as its politics. This is good for business, you know, less crime, you know, less, less, you know, less people going to hospital because they're getting sick all the time. It's a more far-sighted vision than a lot of right-wing, you know, prescriptions, policy prescriptions, including some of those we see here in New Zealand. So I think that what we have now is a, you know, a business and military elite that understand that the Bolsonaro movement, you know, that, that you know, the, the ideology underpinning Bolsonaro's rise to power, that will remain. And as a result of that, he becomes expendable. Again, expendable, at least for the short term, because he can come back and compete again. In fact, I have a feeling that if he's done in politically, it'll be by his own side because they realize that he's a liability. But we shall see. But the idea is you can have the movement. When I was a kid growing up in Argentina, they used to talk about peronismo sin peron, peronism without peron. Mm. And it's because Peron was in exile. But his movement lived on. It was a, a thorn in the side of the military dictatorships that I lived under. And it, uh, it still it remains today in many, in many respects, doesn't it, Peronists? Yeah. Well, Peronists are, Peronists are in power in Argentina yeah. today. Now, we won't get into Argentina because that's, that's a basket case. But will another is, episode at some stage. It'll be interesting. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'll start crying because it's such, yeah. it's such a tragedy. But... The, uh, the issue is the movement remains. The movement is what important, the man is not. And I think that this was a quick realization by conservative Brazilian elites. And so what we have now is Bolsonaro waiting for something to happen. But the repressive apparatus has already shown whose side it's on by repressing these words. They're doing it gently. I mean, by Brazilian standards, what I've seen uh, is remarkably mild. Uh, this is, you know, some of these police and whatnot, the, fe the federal police, they're murderous. They're murderous. And here they're just lobbing tear gas and you know, asking people to politely leave. I mean, I'm like, okay, they're doing very good here. You know, it's, it's kid glove stuff. But I think this is uh, in part, as a result of a learning curve derived from the Trump experience in uh, 2019, 2020. Okay. I think so, that the Brazilians... We, we... Yep, sorry, yep, sorry. I... Oh, I just think that the advisors to Bolsonaro, but more importantly, the elites that backed him in the previous election now understand having watched Woman On in the United States, that it's better for them that Bolsonaro leave the scene and uh, they get on with business. Because, you know, again, with the opposition controlled by Bolsonaro allies, the major governorships controlled by Bolsonaro allies, Lula comes into that, um, he's going to have to compromise if he wants to get anything done. So the, the deck is stacked in their favor 
they know it, and so they're ready to move on. Oh, that's fascinating. Let's take a transition. We'll come back and we'll look at the same concept as applied into the midterm elections in the United States. So that we remember what we're looking at is Trumpism beyond Trump. Um, so it's a bold statement there. And let's look at the, uh, the security of, around that idea. But we'll be right back in a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds. Yeah, welcome back, um, people. Um, now, Paul, um, we're going to hit into the United States midterm elections now. And um, I suppose traditionally, historically, you know, midterms have always been, in many respects anyway, a bit of a litmus test in some ways on the incumbent presidency, particularly in the first term of a presidency. And remember that under Obama, we saw, you know, a real kickback where the Republicans um, took opportunity of strength when the midterms came up with Obama in, in both opportunities there. So, you know, we're looking at, at this, and I, I guess with the popularity of Joe Biden being questionable, you know, he has his ups and downs, but generally it's pretty low um, support um, on, on popularity terms with respect to uh, Biden, irrespective of whether or not the people actually endorse the policies that his administration has actually embarked on. But, and successfully, you've pointed out in previous episodes, but if we're looking at this, there's more complexity. There's all sorts of uh, legislation or, that has been um, strengthened from the United States um, Supreme Court, for example, Roe versus Wade, all these other things that came in, whether or not that was going to be a big circuit breaker for the Democrats that they could leverage off. And we really saw the grand old party, the Republican Party, struggling at the seams with the realisation that Trump supported or endorsed candidates we're really strongly in the mix. And Paul, there's a number of, with respect to the Senate, there's a number of outlining, um, uh, is, is that the word, the outliers, um, you know, the, the, the seats that ca can go either way and there's a lot of eyes on trying to actually see what the probabilities of those going back to the Democrats are or going um, back to the Republican Party. Paul, um, that's just a bit of a sketch um, to lay the ground. Can you take us through this Trumpism on Trump? Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> again, we're getting really close. We're five days away from the midterms. The Republicans appear to have the advantage, uh, both in the uh, House and, and the Senate, at least I'll, I'll put a caveat in soon. The issue is this, I believe, is um, Trumpism is going to last for a considerable amount of time not only in this election, but subsequent elections, regardless of whether Trump runs again or not. If he was a little less vain, a little less narcissistic, he would have realized that he can be the kingmaker behind the scenes. And people who are a lot sharper than him when it comes to legislative affairs, foreign relations and the like, could uh, you know sit in front of the curtain, but he could be the puppet master in determining who those people are. Uh, he's still the fly in the ointment, but I think that we can safely say that among conservatives in the United States, that's the main idea, keep MAGA going, and whether or not he comes back to run again. The idea is he's unleashed this movement. It is populist, it is retrograde, heavily, uh, if, if hypocritically rooted in evangelical Christian values, which is another word in the United States for saying racist, uh, you know, and I, I say that with no shame whatsoever because they've revealed themselves now uh, for what they are. Uh, the issue is this, do the business elites of the United States want to continue to countenance uh, a MAGA version of the Republican Party, a party that is now uh, openly anti-democratic. I mean, that's the thing is the Republicans have revealed because of the MAGA influence that they're not interested in democracy. They're just interested in power and reestablishing some mythical, you know, white male dominated thing from the past. And I will say this, uh, the strategy to use the Federalist Society 
as a wedge into the Supreme Court under Trump has worked incredibly well. They got the reversal of Roe versus Wade. They are now about to reverse affirmative action, and it'll be too soon for those who are going to be negatively affected to react before the midterm, or perhaps not. If they're dumb enough, the Supreme Court, that is, to announce the rollback of affirmative action between now and next Tuesday, American time, uh, we may see a backlash to that, as I'm hoping we'll see the backlash to the reversal of Roe versus Wade. And what does the backlash look like? Is that a strong turnout for the Democrats? Is that what we're talking about here with a strong reaction? Yes, we need, first of all, um, there's a couple of truisms of American politics, right? One is the midterm election always goes against the president's party. Uh, that regardless of whether they're Republican or Democrat, very it's, it's the exception to the rule that the president's party does well in the midterm right following uh, his first election. So this is one for the Democrats to lose. Uh, if, you know, historical president is a guide by. Uh, the issue is this has gotten a little more complex because there, I'm not entirely sure that the entire Republican Party, or I should say the Republican establishment, which includes Wall Street, which includes, you know, the fossil fuel industries. I mean, there's a lot of big economic in, in, industry interests uh, in the Republican Party. I think they're going through the same motions that was happening in Brazil. Does Trump and MAGA serve our interests or are they now becoming more of an impediment to our respective projects? And I think that's an open question. Uh, the tr trouble here is that he may have succeeded uh, at the behest of others. Don't think for a second that Trump thought up these nominees for the Supreme Court by himself or that he was interested in, leg in judicial reform. Uh, this was an agenda prepared for him, and he was the guy to implement it. In that measure, he's expendable. He did what the Federalists wanted him to do. These justices are in lifetime appointments. They can continue doing this agenda regardless of, you know, who's the monkey in the White House. So uh, I think at this point there's a moment of reckoning. And of course, remember, the walls are closing in on Trump. His criminal liability is becoming more and more apparent. If you're a big business type and what have you, do you really, really want to cling to the sky as yeah. the indictments start rolling in and that sort of thing? And what you're However, talking about there, Paul, for the, um, for the um, viewers and audiences' um, benefit is the importance of an incumbent to recognize the power of stakeholder groups in whatever form that they take. And uh, so in politics, that is a fundamental one. When the, the incumbent or the, the, the representative is no longer effective to address the need or demand of the stakeholders, they're on shallow ground, aren't they? Very, very well put, very well put. But let's look at from, you know, again, the G, this is one for the GOP to lose. Uh, right, I misspoke later, the Democrats lose. The GOP has the advantage here. But let's see what the GOP is doing and their, their media acolytes. They, the economy is this. The, there is high inflation, okay? It's going to run about 8% uh, uh, for the year, okay? So inflation's bad. But there's a slow realization in the United States that inflation is not Joe Biden's fault. It's a global phenomenon. And, uh, and, and now the Democrats are starting to put that out there and say, well, the United States 8%, but Germany is going to be around 10%. You know, New Zealand's doing relatively well, considering we're going to be at 6%, I think, by the end of the year. The point is, this is a global phenomenon that Joe Biden can't mitigate by himself. Okay, so let's go to other economic indicators. You would think the Republicans would say, well, we're better stewards of the economy than these Democrats, you know, these liberal spendthrift Democrats. Well, virtually by every other measure, the economy is doing really well. Lowest unemployment in 50 years or 45 years, uh, it's doing immeasurably better than it was in 2019. And that's considering the post-pandemic recovery necessities of the moment. And so they can't really run on Biden's economic record other than barking about inflation. So what 
do they do? They start talking culture wars. They start talking about the southern border, not the northern border, where the guy who attacked Nancy Pelosi's husband happens to be an illegal from Canada. Uh, I would call him undocumented because I don't like that term illegal alien. Uh, this guy, it turns out, was a long-term overstayer who got MAGAized and then lost his mind and went off in a, and attacked her house in San Francisco. Uh, they have nothing economically to speak of. They can't really say much about the security field because if you look back a couple of years, the United States has actually not suffered any major attacks. I mean, yes, they withdrew and from un Afghanistan. Under Trump, under Trump, the place was literally on fire. Look at look at exactly. you know look at look at Oregon Seattle you know what was being pulled out of there look at look at Charlotte yeah <laughs> just you know look at everywhere look at the movement the yeah. Black Lives Matter movement that rose out of Trump um, and I would say as a response um, two way obviously the killing of George Floyd but also you know an, an intolerance to the the White House representing the excesses of division and racism that the black communities and other liberal Americans said enough's enough. Now it drew it out like pus out of a saw. So they can't go crowing on security grounds that they've got the answers, can they? Well, but that doesn't stop them. I mean, they're, again, hypocrisy is, you know, woven into the fabric of politics in general, but of Republicans in particular. Right, one of the cultural war things is they're barking about crime. Now let's be very clear. In some U.S. cities, and of which only some of them are run by Democrats, there has been a spike in violent crime. Uh, most of the sociologists will say this is a post-pandemic thing, that people went a little stir-crazy. Uh, there's been a lot of children, as we have here in New Zealand, did not return to school after the lockdowns and that sort of thing. So a more nuanced view about crime would tell you, well, this is not about Joe Biden and democratic mayors and whatnot. In fact, the overall levels of violent crime have decreased in democratic controlled states and increased in Republican controlled states, mostly in the rural areas, Oklahoma, Wyoming, the Dakotas, they've all seen sharp rises in crime and that's connected to drugs, it's connected to hopelessness. Again, a little too complex for the MAGA crowd to understand. Yeah, when but I think of Wyoming in this context, I often think of uh, the preppers um, and people off the grid that can send a bit of a shiver up your spine too. But we haven't seen a lot of a response from that, have we? In a, in a sense, no, perhaps, no. Luckily. Gosh, when I think of preppers, I think of you know Idaho and Utah because oh, there's a lot of Mormons yeah. there and they, they like to store their stuff. Now, but the, the issue is that the, the Republicans, they don't have you know substantive issues to really run on. Crime is not as bad as they say. The southern border has seen an upsurge in migrants coming through, but that's the post-Trump surge. I mean, whatever happened to those convoys of you know criminally minded aliens coming across the border of two years ago? They never existed. Um, there was this, this thing, because I had to do Halloween here, I'm not a big fan of Halloween, but in the United States, in the buildup to Halloween, the Republicans and conservative media were putting out this fiction that drug dealers were making fentanyl look like uh, colored candy and were putting them out for the kids on Halloween night. And so there was this frenzy of conservative media. Oh, you see the Democrats, you know, they allow these guys. As I pointed out to a friend of mine in Arizona, who is a, a very nice person, but she wasn't thinking this through. I said, look, do you really believe that drug dealers would rent a house or own a house and put drug laced candy out on their doorstep for the kids to pick up and uh, and wait until one of those kids passed out and went to the hospital? I mean, do you think drug deals and of course, they're giving away the candy, so they're not getting revenue for their drug trade. I said, I don't think drug drug dealers operate this way. And even if they did shut shop and leave, then they've abandoned their potential market, right? If you're trying to groom these kids to take fentanyl, you gotta realize that a kid takes a fentanyl tablet, they may not survive, which means the authorities may take an interest in your whereabouts. So 
it was ludicrous to think that Halloween yeah. would be the vehicle. This and whistling course, up the, the the fear factors, and we see this. Exactly. Um, I'm not being I'm not being hyper um, critical to the United States as media apparatus, but we see the manipulations to the advantage of the commercial interests of ma mainstream media across the United States when they build up the fear factors. Um, you can keep people on their sites longer. You can generate dialogue around that. You can have it extended into the public sphere discourse around the water coolers, the smoko tables, the, the, the populations that you're trying to reach to, starting to discuss something that has a basis of no reality. Um, so, you know, you can see the whole thing playing out. Paul, let's have a look at, you know, can you identify some of the th um, states that the um, audience should hone in on that are going to be detrimental to the outcomes of the midterms in a number of five days, isn't it, from now? Yeah, very good. I should point out before I go on, uh, we're now four or five, four days uh, past Halloween, three days past Halloween in the United States. There has been no recorded fentanyl related anything uh, when it comes to Halloween. So it was complete fiction. Um, and I look at it. If you think it through again, you and I have this tendency to, you know, look a little bit further down the road. Imagine if you're a candy manufacturer who has those brightly colored candies. Sales of those candies plummeted after the conservative media started beating up because you supposedly couldn't tell the difference between the drug dealers' offerings and the real deal. Um, what is it? Candy corn was the particular thing that apparently the druggies were lacing. Sales of those things plummeted. Now, from a corporate standpoint, that's not good. Some guy runs his mouth, others pick it up, and all of a sudden your profits are starting to go up. So I don't think we'll see it again. It back, it was total fiction. It backfired, but that's what these guys are doing now. Now, to address your question, there's some very key states here. Uh, you know, the Senate hangs in the balance because it is – uh, there's there's a virtual tie. And so the vice president gets to break those ties. The key states in the Senate will be Florida. Marco Rubio is up, uh, up for re-election. Uh, Arizona, uh, which has now two Democratic senators, which is very rare. Uh, Mark Kelly, the former astronaut, Karen Sinema, who is, she's a, an enigma because she's a Democratic in name only, uh, mostly votes with the Republicans. So, but she's not on the ballot. Mark Kelly is. And so uh, those are big, big, uh, um, excuse me, big uh, 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 electorates. And then there's Pennsylvania, uh, where the infamous Dr. Oz, who doesn't even live in Pennsylvania, has carpeted his bag across the river from New Jersey into Philadelphia to claim residence. And he's going against the Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, who, who has had, had a stroke. stroke. And this great doctor that has come in, carpetbagger, as you've pointed out, has been trying to ridicule his opponent who has survived a stroke. All his faculties are there, obviously as a commanding presence, to say the least. So he's using ridicule on, on medical grounds to try and disestablish his hold. You know, that in itself seems to be a pretty low bar and, well, you know, well unsavory from a, from a good doctor's kind of point of view, isn't it? Well, yeah, not, I mean, not just the doctors. It's particularly, you know, heinous that he's doing it. Let's be very clear. Fetterman, medical experts say he's well on his way to full recovery, that his slip-ups, you know, he, he uses a teleprompter, uh, to answer questions and whatnot, but that that is par for the course. And that by the time he is installed in the Senate, if he wins, he should be 95%, 99% recovered. And as you just said, his mental faculties are there. It's just the delivery mm -hmm. in public sometimes gets jumbled, sort of like a Joe Biden syndrome, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, although the Republicans want to say that Joe Biden's stumbles are signs of dementia and that sort of thing. Fetterman is, definitely is not demented. Um, but this ties into what I would say is a common denominator of the Republicans, which breaks two ways, and that is cruelty. The Republicans are becoming increasingly uncouth, crass, vulgar, but most importantly, cruel. 
Now, most of us will say cruelty is not a good winning political strategy, but in the MAGA world, it is. And I'll give you an example. Pelosi's husband gets attacked by a MAGA guy, a clear MAGA, Q, Anon, the, the full works. He's looking for Nancy Pelosi. He goes into their private residence in San Francisco. She's not there. The husband's there. He attacks the husband violently. Husband goes to the hospital but survives. La, da, la, da, la. This was a heinous attack on uh, a public figure by proxy. What happens? The Republicans, with few exceptions, I will say that Mitch McConnell did, did condemn the attack. But a lot of the Republicans either stayed silent or ridiculed Paul Pelosi, an 82-year-old man. Uh, they came up with the, the most vile conspiracy saying, among other things, that this was a gay lover's quarrel. Uh, you know, I mean, just stuff that was as, as crude uh, as you can get. I mean, just, anyway, but leading figures in the Republican Party engaged in this sort of behavior. And they were abetted by people like Donald Trump Jr., who put out a Halloween costume photo that involved underwear and a hammer, because apparently the assailant was in his underwear or, you know, who knows. Yeah. Uh, this is, they, they've gone so low now, you know, they're looking upwards at the muck. Uh, that's where the Republican Party has gone. And for the minority of people in the Republican Party who go, no, this is not on, the MAGA folk, which are increasingly a majority in that party, are going, yay, let's get as crude as we want. Let's insult people's disabilities. Now, what I would say to you, Selwyn, is I don't know where this is going to go. Uh, Unfortunately, my uh, survey sample in the United States suffers from selection bias because my friends and family in the United States are civilized people. And so uh, 100% of those I interact with go, this was terrible. I mean, this was absolutely terrible. It was terrible to even think that you could go attack a political figure. But then to home invade them and bash the husband, that now that's yeah. off. That's really and wrong. then get some sort of ridicule support from political power elites as a as a as a, 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 a nephew, You know, is, what can you say about that? It's an absolutely clear indication of the value base of that faction within a party of which the United States democratic equation relies on. Now, so but, what we're yeah, seeing, yeah. what we're seeing here is a midterm on the basis in many respects of that itself, haven't, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, I, that's why I don't know how it's going to break, because there's a lot of people who think this is funny or yeah. think this is the way to do it. And I'll give you another one. Kanye West comes out with some insane anti-Semitic trope uh, a week or so ago. I mean, we're talking, you know, old school anti-Semitism. And that followed on Donald Trump putting out a tweet that said American Jews were not grateful enough, that he was the best defender of Israel, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And uh, Kanye West piles on. You know, remember, Trump opened the floodgates. American Jews are not grateful. All right, dog yeah. whistle yeah. there. Yeah. Kanye comes back, he bites, says, yeah, the Jews are evil and whatnot. Uh, Kanye West was condemned and some of his sponsors and whatnot pulled out. But then we started seeing people putting out banners over overpasses, tweeting up a storm about Kanye is right. So the now, audience Kanye, is beyond those that you've identified, like your, your sensitivities of the people that you engage with that are residing back in the United States are quite separate to what that whistle was all about. So Trump is not right, an idiot, is he? he, he the, the, no. When he does these things, you know, you can easily underestimate someone who has a, who is bereft of value, and is a megalomaniacal, some would say, uh, malignant narcissist. But he's not stupid. And and pulling that base, getting that base to respond, irrespective of color. In some ways, that's politically destabilizing and disturbing genius. 
Yeah, I mean, weasel genius, but it's also very short term. Yeah. I mean, you did say he's a malignant nar narcissist. I think of it this way. If you're going to strategize this out, dog whistling the anti-Semites out of their holes, what purpose does it serve the Republican Party over the long term? None. Okay, it's not good. It may serve Trump's purposes for re-election. I mean, that's, I was trying to think, what could get me to reveal a really dark, horrible thing about myself done by a politician? Now, I don't have these sort of hatreds in me. And I'm like, you know, he he's bringing out this crowd that should have stayed in their holes. They're now out openly identifying, not just with Trump and Kanye, but with the MAGA movement. And I'm like, you're polluting whatever message you had that was good. And I don't think there was much good in, what, in the MAGA message. But now we're going into very dark corners, seriously dark corners. Corners that involve touching, playing footsie with the likes of Vladimir Putin, who is now openly addressing Western right-wingers about traditional values and how their societies are going to hell in a handbasket and he's the one to defend them. Uh, it's really gotten out of hand. And this is where I'm in a quandary. If I was to sit in a crowd that involved you, me, the people I know in the States, our friends, et cetera, I would say, okay, this is counterproductive. These guys are going to lose because you can't go into full anti-Semite mode and expect to win elections. On the other hand, this is the United States 2022. This is the United States with MAGA as probably the most united political movement in the United States because the Democrats can't offer this anything close to this uh, amount of unity. And I'm like, you know, I'm not so sure that this is a losing political strategy in the buildup to next Tuesday. And if it turns out they win, the Republicans win, then you're absolutely right. It is genius that you we come saw, up in the last few days. We saw no, back go ahead. When, when Trump was first elected to the presidency. So if we just roll back about two weeks prior to that, and obviously we, we know now all of the uh, attacks that were occurring and, you know, the, the dog whistling relating to QAnon type of, you know, conspiracy theories, et cetera, et cetera. Obama came out and stood on a platform as the outgoing president in support, obviously, of Hillary Clinton, the candidate that the Democrats had chosen at that time. And he made a speech about his trust in the good American people, that they would prevail, that they had the majority, and that they would express that at the votes, and that there was no way the United States would lose ground on that. So this illustrates, in a recent history, exactly the concerns that you were detailing there. And... You know, the, I'll just bring up on screen, Paul, just to illustrate that some of the things that we are de Paul has developed here, this idea of how on the basis of one's own social group's values, we can misread election outcomes, and we all have in the past. Now, one of the things I've just brought up on screen is 538, and that's Nate Silver and his team, and Galen Druk, he, he's often the host of their podcasts. They look at all the polls. They look deep diving down into what those polls mean. Paul mentioned earlier on about how questions with respect for, for Pinochet's um, interests in the Constitution can be caged in a way that can predict an outcome. And so Nate Silver's group here, 538, looks at all of that, but much more beyond. It looks like demographics, all, all sorts of things. Why I've brought it up on screen is they're looking at the probabilities under certain conditions. If such and such a candidate comes through, everything changes. What does that change? And I'd stress the audience that is interested in the outcomes of the midterms to check this out, to keep up to date with some of the work that they're doing because... Honestly, they are formidably accurate in many respects. Now, back to us, Paul. Just wanted to give that plug. These guys are super cool at what they do. It also, it also gives me an opportunity to talk about a, uh, a phenomenon that's occurring in this election, and th thanks to referencing 538, which I agree is very good value. Here's something that's emerged in this election that I hadn't noticed before. It turns out the Republican National Committee 
is commissioning private survey companies to do pre-election surveys, polling, uh, but with the explicit mandate that the surveys come out to show that the Republicans are running ahead. In other words, they're fake, complete fake surveys. But here's the genius. They don't then go back and announce the surveys, okay, the Republicans. Instead, the surveying companies, again, all Republican affiliated, feed the media in local jurisdictions, so cities, states, not the national media, feed the media these bogus polls that show the Republicans running ahead in all of those contested elections we've talked about. Uh, it's completely fake, okay? It's disinformation. They take a life on their own. Once the media picks up on it, they're looking for clickbait and what have you. Yeah. They run with it. And before you know it, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy. People all believe, well, Dr. Oz is going to win. I mean, yeah. you know, what's the point? You know, I mean, yeah. he's, he's ahead by six points. So they don't this express is... their interest in getting out there to make an individual vote that cumulatively can um, hold. It's like a own. done deal. It's like a done deal. It's incredible. I only, I, I cottoned on to this because I have an American friend, a former lifeguard friend, uh, who follows politics. He's, you know, not a political science, but an avid politics watcher. And I noticed that on his thread on Twitter, there was some funky stuff. And he, you know, he got a hold of me and said, man, the polls are running really badly against us. What's going on? And I started looking into who the pollsters were. I'm like, but these are not legitimate pollsters. These are not university think tanks. You know, the, the normal folk, you know, like the Rasmussen poll and the Siena College poll. These are other private polling companies. Come to find out, they're all fake, okay? The Republicans know that they're losing in some places. See, this is a sign of desperation. This is why I feel good about next Tuesday because I lean Democratic, is these guys are now pulling out all the stops to include putting out fake polls, knowing that the media is gonna bite because the media is not critical. And, you know, maybe the national media have intellects, you know, running the show. I don't know about that. But when you get down to the local and state level, you're not getting, you know, you know, Churchill's and, you know, serious political minds here. They're like, wow, the polls that said that Fetterman were, was winning by four points last week now say that Oz is ahead by six. Let's put that out there. And then you get the snowball effect. So it's evil genius at work. I just think that it's a sign of desperation on the part of the Republicans. And that gives me comfort uh, because, you know, I, I voted in the U.S. elections. I still have that right. And to be honest with you, uh, it was almost straight Democrat uh, because I happened to vote in the state of Florida. Uh, I want to see Rubio gone. Um, I want to see their governor, DeSantis, gone. Uh, and so I found who, who myself could be a challenge to Trump, in the, you know, for the presidency next time, potentially. Yeah, he's the one of those guys. Who, but see, he can ride the Trumpism without Trump wave. Yeah. See, DeSantis is smarter than Trump, at least politically speaking. And he sees an opportunity. Trump is finally convinced or indicted. But his movement is still there. It's still alive and breathing and dangerous. And then okay, he at this comes point, in. There's there's a very good question, and this is getting down to an individualistic response. You know, if, if the things like Roe versus Wade and other things that you've um, identified compel people to get out there to vote, David Mooring's put the question to you, Paul, is the only way to save the US Republican Party is, is to not vote for the Republican Party itself in these midterms, even if you are a long-term Republican? Now, we saw the same question raising itself um, during the presidential elections uh, between Trump and Biden. What do, what do you make of that? Is, it, is there still a, a, a cultural, a, a political response from those social conservative elements within the Republican Party that would hold their nose and vote for the Democrat? Or is it gone? Yeah, I, I think that it, it may be... It may, it may be a necessary but not a sufficient condition. Let me run this this analogy. Uh, I may be told that I'm a serious drunk and I need to get my act together. And I can be told that by my wife, my family, my friends. 
but I'm going to keep on drinking. And then one day I find myself laying in an alleyway in my own filth. And at that point, I have a choice. I can either realize that I'm a chronic alcoholic and I need to get help, or I can get up and try to find the next bottle. Yeah. That's where the Republican I'm leaving Party... Las Vegas um, situation, you know, the good old movie that Nicolas Cage did. Yeah, I, I just yeah. think the Republican Party is the political equivalent of a chronic alcoholic. Uh, juicing itself on the MAGA rush and until they realize that the change has to come from within, they're not going to change. Now, David is right in that if moderate Republicans start voting against their own party, and many are, the Lincoln Project fellows, uh, the columnist Max Boot, who's you know not a liberal person at all, uh, Bill Kristol, who's a neocon from way back when. I'd say uh, the Chine Chinese, you know. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. They're either going to abstain, but many have said, no, we're going to vote Democratic because you guys are, are dangerous. You're, you know, you're trouble. Again, that's a necessary but not sufficient. Inside the core of the Republican Party, again, this Republican National Committee that is putting out is funding these fake polls. They need to realize that they got to stop. They got to look inside their hearts and go, you know, are we really a racist anti-Semite at the core party? Is that what we are? Um, and I think that a lot of them will say, no, I, you know, I'm not sure how we got onto this train, but we got to well, get off. Well, speaking of that, we've got Israel, we'll get that discussion going too. But this, this whole thing here is a fascinating response to midterm elections traditionally would be a test of incumbency. But this one appears, take it from a simplistic point of view that I'm pitching here, but it's a test on the grand old party itself. That's a good insight, Selwyn. So you're a little ahead of the mainstream pundits. It, it, I agree with you 100%. Yeah, it's about Biden and whatnot. But, you know, but again, the shallowness is about you know the, uh, these pundits who talk about Biden and whatnot. Yeah, it's that. And again, we have the historical precedents and whatnot, but you absolutely nailed it. This is about the GOP and where the GOP wants to go. And this gets back to our central point with, about Brazil. You know, you can have the movement without the guy, but is that where you really want to go? In Brazil, the conservative side of the equation have to go, yes, we can have Bolsonaroism without Bolsonaro, but is that where we really want to go? And so there's going to be some soul searching, no matter which way. I think that if the Republicans lose, uh, if there is indeed a goddess, then the knives are going to start coming out because uh, Trump's endorsements are not always uh, very good. He endorsed Bolsonaro, among other things. Yeah. And so if MAGA endorsed candidates uh, lose in any significant number, then um, then we may start seeing a self-reflection on the part of moderate Republicans. They're, they're, right now, they're too cowardly to come out other than Liz Cheney and a few others. Uh, but if they win, they will be emboldened. I think the takeover of the Republican Party will be complete. The trouble then is if they win, and even if uh, DeSantis or Trump himself come back into the presidency, can they govern? Yeah. You see, the policies that would follow from, you know, again, you know, the racist, the, you know, all this sort of stuff, that's not a good policy agenda. You know, that's not a platform to run on in a general no, election. No. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure that, uh, although of the short term prospects of MAGA Republicans will be well served by a victory in this midterm, I think for the Republican Party as a whole, uh, to say nothing of, of, of the U.S. as a, as a nation, uh, it's going to be, it's going to darken the prospects of yeah. a revitalization. Because remember, uh, as a legislative agenda right now, Kevin McCarthy and the Republicans are saying, if we win the majority of the House, we're going to roll back all of Joe Biden's legislative initiatives, all of them. They have nothing to offer. They're just like, we're going to roll everything back, take yeah. it or leave it, including uh social security guarantees 
mean, this is money. This is this is not the government's money. Social Security is what you know, people like me put into the Social Security. It's a forced retirement fund. For those you Kiwis put in, the, in the audience, it's kind of like Kiwi Saver in a sense. Or just an it American is very, version very good. Of, it's not, yeah. Right. It's not like our retirement system here in New Zealand. We have a very different system. But in the States, in your working life, you contribute X amount. Your employers contribute X amount, which is then subsidized by the government. And that accrues interest in a separate account that has nothing to do with the federal budget. Okay, that's your money. Uh, and uh, uh, the Republicans are saying, we're going to roll it back. And we're going to make the retirement age 75 instead of 65. Yeah. And from now on, well, those who are in you the free fall, eh? Work will set you well, free. this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm a beneficiary of U.S. Social Security. And uh, they're saying, well, if we come in, guys like Buchanan are going to receive 85% of what they got before we came into power. Well, let's just say there's a lot of geriatric people in the United States who depend on those Social Security checks. Again, it, they paid into it for 40 years. Then the Republicans are saying, no, we're taking it away. Yeah, they and want we'll the spend loop. it on defense. And they want the loop because so, they want to break down the um, that order. You know, what, what comes through from the, sorry sorry to um, truncate this, but it, 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 it appears that one of the things when Trump was president, you know, and we talked about can they come through with these policies and actually govern whether it be at state legislature um, level in this respect with midterms. But out of chaos, these guys seem to be able to leverage some sort of control. And that's what we saw with Trump, and that's the main concern. Paul, let's just this transition. We'll get into the Israel yeah. elections. Let's do it right now. Yeah, welcome back, people. Um, um, Paul, um, yeah, let, let's get um, this, this dig down into the Israeli elections. There's a, a fascinating two-part evaluation that um, I understand that you've um, been developing, uh, re, you know, and uh, I think it would be hugely beneficial to listen to this and uh, for the audience to uh, basically have a, a view on if they so choose as well. Yeah, okay. Well, the, uh, the backdrop is that they just held elections in Israel, the Likud-led coalition that has Benjamin Netanyahu as its, its leader. Uh, he's been in power, for, well, he was in power for 12 years uh, before he was removed. In the last election, he's uh, uh, facing charges of corruption. You know, there's a lot of problems with Benjamin Netanyahu, but he's put together a coalition that is now the most right-wing coalition in Israeli history. And they won a majority in the parliamentary elections held two days ago. They'll wind up with a minimum of 61, 62 seats in a 120 uh, seat Knesset. Uh, and, um, and as a result, can rule outright on their own. Uh, again, the most right wing, he's included in his coalition some Orthodox Jewish uh, 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 settler parties that, among other things, uh, believe that the, um, the, the English shouldn't be taught in schools. Uh, are very retrograde. I, I won't get into the list of crazy things they think. But he's gone that way. The uh, the liberal, or it's actually phrased as the anti-Netanyahu coalition, has 54 seats guaranteed, and they include a couple of small Arab parties. Uh, and then there are four independent seats. So no matter what the left side of the equation does, Netanyahu uh, can, can govern outright. But again, most right-wing coalition ever assembled in Israel, uh, that says a lot because the last coalitions have all been right-wing and getting increasingly more hard line. They've had five elections since 2019. It's very unstable uh, yeah. polity in Israel. Now, here's the two things that, uh, you know, without getting into all the usual arguments, there's two things that strike me from this election. Uh, one short term, if you will, and very political, and then the other one more existential. The short term political one is this. Security is the default option in Israel. That is to say, every time there's an election 
everybody starts getting very militant on uh, terrorism, uh, Palestinian militancy, and the like. That includes the Israeli left. The Israeli left is probably the least progressive when it comes to oppressed people trying to liberate themselves through the force of arms. Uh, even the left leans right uh, when it comes to electoral cycles. And so uh, everybody shifted to the right to outflank each other. And Hamas and Hezbollah don't do themselves favor, at least in the election cycle, because they step up, <coughs> excuse me, their militant attacks. And that plays into the hands of the fear mongers. Now, they may have strategic reasons for do, doing so. I'm sure that there are hardliners on the Palestinian side that want to provoke a larger war. Uh, you know, then that's sort of standard procedure in irregular warfare and what have you. Uh, but the issue is the default option in Israel for an election is start barking about security. As you've shifted the narrative off to the right, if you're on the right, you win. But this has shifted Netanyahu to a more hard line saint with these, these really radical right wingers. I don't know if that's uh, a marriage that's going to last, but that's where we are. The bigger point, I think, is that these elections are increasingly about Israeli identity. That is, what does it mean to be an Israeli? Does it mean that you have to be Jewish? Well, 20% of Israel is Arab. Uh, almost 2 million out of almost 10 million Israelis are Arab born in Israel. And we know that they're systematically discriminated against. We know that they are effectively disenfranchised in many instances. And yet, as the Arab parties on the left hand of the side, they still try to compete. I mean, they, they want to be citizens in the full sense of the world. So I think what we're seeing is a just a, a constant re-examination re of what it means to be Israeli. Do, do you have to be Orthodox to be considered? Do you have to even be Jewish uh, to be an Israeli? And that I think is at the heart of these elections is there's an identity crisis because for Israel to survive, they need to become more cosmopolitan. Uh, native born Jews in Israel are not reproducing at the rates that either the Arab population is or the imported Orthodox population is. And you may say to yourself, not you, but the audience, what do you mean imported? In order to overcome that population imbalance, Israel has immigration policies that favor the importation of Jews, particularly from the United States and Russia. And the Jewish people who wanna to go to Israel by and large, are orthodox in their beliefs. They're not secular Jews. They're not moderate. They are fundamentalists. And so they're coming into the mix. They are the people being represented now in Netanyahu's coalition. But that doesn't represent the entirety of what being Israeli is all about. I mean, there's again, there's many secular Jews. And there's a lot of non-Jews. Uh, who consider themselves Israeli. So, so, so how, how did you see this um, creep into this election? I, I guess that's what your, 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 um, your thread is, is building toward. You know, that if, if there is an identity politics in play here which accentuates the belief that to be Israeli is to be Jewish, uh, how are we seeing it at the ballot box and how are we seeing it as the coalition's position to take their power and, and become the incumbencies? What does it look like? Well, you know, temporarily, or I should say short term, it seems that what's leaning, the tide is leaning in favor of you're Israeli if you're Jewish, you're not Israeli if you're not. But I think that's a short-sighted view. I think that although these tactical victories, again, five elections in four years, I mean, this is very unstable, may show, uh, you know, and on the surface, that um, those who think that Israel is for and by the Jews only uh, is winning. I think that if you look at the opposition, again, 62 seats for Netanyahu's coalition, 56, 57 seats 
for the anti-Netanyahu coalition, which includes Arabs, I think what we're seeing is basically an electoral contest over identity. And that actually the longer term trend, given the demographics of the moment, indicate that if you know we get down 10 years down the road, that um, that thing may get balanced out. Now, fear mongering and constantly bringing up the security issue is a short term solution. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe in Israel, you just yell Palestine and people all rush over to put their helmets on and start waiting to you know, wage war on somebody. I'm not so sure. I mean, there's there's on the moderate side of the Israeli political spectrum, there are people who do believe in the two state solution. They do believe that the settlements on occupied land are wrong, that are making things worse rather than better. And uh, in that measure, I think that the most important, and again, the existential thing for Israelis to consider above and beyond the elections of the moment is who are they? What yeah. are we? Let's say if so I was an know, Israeli. You know, before we um, embarked on this episode, you know, we had a discussion about this. And one of the things that I kind of said to you was, you know, over the years, you know, you, I might be on radio, I might be um, discussing this in a media context or whatever, this issue of, of Israel as a homeland in its own identity and its right to exist and all of the complexities from afar of what a one-state or a two-state solutions, what, what do they mean and how are they applied and what are the risks for all issues on a human rights, political, sustainable economic basis? One of the ways to be able to debate that, in my view, has always been to approach the government of Israel and to discuss the implementation of its decisions and actions from the point of secularism, that the state of Israel as a secular body does not necessarily respect within the context of debate the Jewish faith. Now, I think around the world we've all stood in horror at reading our histories of which our parents, in many respects, lived through and saw what happened to the Jewish people in Europe and beyond, while many in the beginning of that whole abomination stood silent around the world while it happened. And so we share that. But if there is, if you are right, that we are seeing a political movement that somehow identifies that to be Israeli is to exclusively be Jewish, then it takes away the ability of independent analysis of rights and wrongs and discourse from approaching it from secularism, and you're drawn into a situation where if you criticise or you oppose, then the finger can be pointed back that you're an anti-Semite. Now, Paul, I see that as a huge challenge from the point of view of political discourse. Is that one of the traps that you identify there as well? Well, for those who want to criticize Israel, I mean, I think your your point is good. We've got to distinguish between the Israeli state and the Israeli people. And you know, to which I'd add, not all Israeli people are necessarily Jewish, but much less Zionists. And, you know, we have to be very clear. Um, there's a lot of people in Israel who are not hardcore Zionists. Now, I look at I dismiss at a hand accusations made against me or anyone else, particularly someone like you of anti-Semitism when we dare to be critical about the actions of the Jewish state, the Jewish state, and it's like sort of a bad joke. Uh, my concern is this, the state, I agree with you, the state should be secular. The state uh, should be an instrument of the common will of the Israeli people. But if the governments that uh, administer that state, that manage that state, are increasingly dominated by religious figures or people who espouse religious philosophies that are inimical to um, uh, harmonious living amongst heterogeneous groups, then we have a problem because the state is becoming an instrument for a factional view, not a common wheel view. And that would trouble me. And uh, certainly, and its security behavior, 
Um, you know, Israel has a lot to answer for. I'd hate to say it. One thing I read that I think is very interesting, and this is, you know, sometimes you find these little glimmers or nuggets of, of intelligence out there when it comes to arguing about Israel. And someone smarter than me pointed out Netanyahu, Netanyahu's problem is that by incorporating these really right wing uh, people on his coalition, people who, again, think, you know, Muslims are, are animals and, you know, I mean, you know, crazy land stuff. He's going to alienate his Arab neighbors. You know, Israel has worked hard to cultivate the Egyptians, the Saudis. You know, they now have diplomatic relations with the UAE, with Qatar. Uh, you know, they've, they've worked very hard to be accepted at some level within the Middle East. And yet this could undermine that because he's now married factions that don't even recognize the legitimacy of the Arabs at all. And what I find ironic about this is, uh, I said this to my political science wife earlier, can you name me one liberal regime in the entire Middle East? One. The answer is no. Uh, the entire Middle East, now that Israel has gone rightwards, is dominated by, quite frankly, authoritarians. Some may have elections, some may not. But no one in their right mind, much less a political scientist, can tell you that Israel today is a duly constituted liberal democracy. It has drifted right and righter and righter, which may satisfy its neighbors. But in terms of the foundations of Israel as a state, is inimical to what it represented to Jews around the world at the moment of creation. So I think that this could become a problem for Israel diplomatically, and that in turn will reverberate inside of Israel in terms of its identity. I mean, if you don't recognize the legitimacy of the Arabs in your midst, again, native born people who happen to be of Arab ethnicity and Muslim in religious persuasion, then you may start running once again into the old problems with your neighbors. Quite frankly, um, you know, I've already shown my biases, but think of it this way. If you think of Israel as a Jewish state, what you're basically saying is that it's an ethnic state. Now, that may have been something that many Zionists believed to be true in 1948, 1967, 1973, so on and so forth. But given the changes that I've mentioned, the need to become more cosmopolitan to keep up with the pace of world events, I'm not entirely sure that trying to uh, consolidate uh, a ethno state in this day and age is going to work. I simply don't. And so I agree with you. Uh, we should focus on the sins of the state, not of its society. But on the other hand, if its society is getting radicalized in an ethnocentric way, which this election seems to indicate, at least over the short term, there's going to be more trouble ahead rather than less of it. Yeah, well, let's wrap it up on that point. Thank you, Paul. And thanks for putting that within a, uh, a context that we can all digest and um, develop views on. I uh, appreciate that very much. So thank you to the audience that has stayed with us through this uh, live recording and also to those that will join it and listen to this right to the end on, uh, on uh, platforms of demand. Um, so just remember that uh, View From Afar is out on just about every podcast platform you can imagine and um, it is certainly one where is far beyond just the live expression. So um, we appreciate people subscribing to that too. But remember too that these discussions that have come through and that a lot of um, comments have been coming through that I've brought up on screen that those that are listening and not watching may have not seen. Now those can be looked at on the timeline as they appear in real time uh, on the YouTube platform and I encourage people to take that debate there and to continue it going. And, uh, that would be an interesting thing if they do. So thank you again, and we'll be back. Our intention is to be back next, uh, next Thursday, New Zealand time around midday, and next Wednesday 
uh, US time on, uh, around 6 p.m. on the e um, eastern uh, side of the United States. Um, and until that time, we'll come back with something that'll be really interesting and we're shaping in our minds right now. Um, midterm. Again, midterm, and also uh, what, what, what those trends mean. So, uh, Kakiti Anon, we look forward to your company once again. Thanks for hanging in there with us. Goodbye.